for news agents. When I came back from a run this morning, Vladimir Putin was doing a call-in show to the nation, what they call results of the year with Vladimir Putin on all the major Russian TV channels. When we started recording, it was still going on. It is a marathon. It is all dominant. And it comes from a man who's sounding like he's got a lot to talk about to the public. Вот я напомню, о чем мы тогда говорили. О денацификации Украины, о о демилитаризации. I'd like to be able to say that the translation of that is I made a terrible mistake, I should never have invaded Ukraine and I'm really sorry for all the chaos that I've caused. Of course, that's not what he said. He said peace will come when we achieve our goals and those goals have not changed, which is the denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. This was Vladimir Putin feeling confident about the future. Welcome to the news agents. It's John. It's Emily. And as you said in the introduction, it was a marathon. Um, where it is. <laughs> I it, think is it, it still might, going on? I think so. Is it yes. still going on 18 hours later? Right. I mean, I think the length is kind of important because this was an event that was cancelled last year after the invasion of Ukraine. And things it's, were going badly. Right. And he thinks that it's worth coming back now and doing it at length. And this is not commercial TV, right? It's not kind of what do people want to watch in the daytime in Russia. This is the president of what is essentially a police state in the middle of a war that is illegal. It is an invasion telling the people what he wants them to hear. End of. And what he is telling them is that it's all going jolly well without talking about the casualties. And I just think it is worth underlining. And this is according to an American intelligence report, which has been leaked, which suggests that so far, the death and casualties on the Russian side so far stand at 315,000 men dead or injured. Just to put that in some kind of context, the total manpower of the British army is 75,000 a quarter. So it's like four British armies have either been wiped out or seriously injured in the past year and a bit. Mm. It is astonishing. And he's throwing more and more people onto the front line. And there's a really interesting poll that The Times has done today, trying to find out what Russian people really think, because 70% will say that they support the war. And that is generally in opinion polls, that is not because 70% of Russian people support the war. It's because they are terrified that if they don't say that publicly or if they are seen not to agree with the war, they will be reported, condoned to the authorities. But in this particular opinion poll, it was asking what you would want to ask the president, right, if you had the chance. And one in every four people decline to say what they'd even ask, such as the terror. They do not want to have their thoughts publicly voiced even on an anonymous poll. And we know that every single question that comes in is closely filtered. But the Kremlin, as you've said, is facing pressure from the wives, from the mothers, from the family members of all those soldiers who might have gone willingly to the front line a year ago, maybe in ignorance, but don't know what they're doing there now. And... According to this report, the wives have set up a a telegram channel called The Way Home to try and bring them back. They flooded this call-in centre with questions, you know, asking when their spouses will be home. Those questions are not getting through. Really? Yeah, funnily enough, they're not. Well, the other thing that did happen, though, which I do think is interesting, that for all this is stage managed to within an inch of its life and is very heavily manicured and, and, you know, curated so that you get the message of Vladimir Putin being the strong leader who empathises with people's problems... Various questions did flash up on the screen behind him saying, why is your reality at odds with our lived reality? Mr. President, when will the real Russia be the same as the one on TV? Hello, when will it be possible to move to the Russia they tell us about on Channel One? So I think dissident voices were getting through. Now, it may not have been a major questioning of the war effort, but the real 
concerns of people. I, I saw one about the why does it cost so much to buy half a dozen eggs? It's too expensive and we can't live like this. And so I think that the frustrations of the Russian people were on display in the Kremlin, weirdly, this morning. Yeah. And I guess the context for this is that Putin thinks that things aren't going as badly as they were militarily in Ukraine, that he is starting to feel confident enough to think there could be an end in sight. And he's also announced he's running for a new six-year term. Oh, I wonder if he'll get in. You know, that's not the question that is being asked because, again, I go back to this idea. It is a police state. If you condemn the war in any shape or form, in restaurants, in nightclubs, they call the police, right? If you're overheard discussing it in negative terms, then the police are called in. Kids I, have been dragged out of school for putting, uh, doing an anti-war painting. Right, I right. Mean, you know. So here is a man who's basically not petitioning, not campaigning, not, I don't think, really listening to the questions that are coming in. He's there just starting to tell the Russian people who's in charge and, he thinks, will be for another six years. And Vladimir Putin is looking across the Atlantic at what's happening in America, where a quarrelsome democracy is holding up aid to Ukraine because of a row about what's happening on the southern border of the United States of America. Yeah. And he's probably rubbing his hands. And again, in Europe, the EU is meeting in Brussels to discuss a four year funding package of 50 billion euros uh, for Ukraine. But that's being held up by uh, Vladimir's friend, Viktor Orban from Hungary. So he's rubbing his hands at that. Right. So. What seemed like absolutely solid support a year ago when he cancelled his news conference is looking much more fractured and fragile today. And I think that's reflected in the very figure of Zelensky now. I mean, do you remember when Zelensky sort of first did his tours of the European parliaments, of the US Senate, of Congress? You know, he was the time of the year man and he seemed the soldier and the embodiment of patriotism and, and, and true fight for the people for the struggle of Ukraine. And now he's sort of sitting there with Joe Biden, terrified he's going to come away empty handed. And Biden is terrified he's going to come away empty handed because of the fight he's got, not just, I think, with members of the Republican Party, but with maybe an increasingly fractious public who are being told that Biden's spending money on foreign wars when it could be going on their gas bills and on their groceries. And I think it's becoming much harder. Yeah. We're going to hear from two American voices now who've been right at the heart of foreign affairs, of US diplomacy, and they disagree with the way forward for America and for Ukraine right now. Let's hear firstly from Richard Haas, a former close advisor to President George Bush, uh, a diplomat, and you might know him from the Council of Foreign Relations. He has been right at the coalface of a lot of these questions for many years now. And Richard, just the mere fact that this kind of extraordinary, long, rambling, sort of call-in televised press conference um, took place with Vladimir Putin today, I guess tells you that he's feeling pretty buoyant, that there is a confidence in him now, right? Unfortunately, I'm afraid you are right. He looks at the divisions at home in Ukraine. You're beginning to see some political splits uh, amongst the, the, the leadership. Here uh, in Washington, President Zelensky had a, a, essentially an unsuccessful visit this week. He couldn't break the impasse, though I would add that I think ultimately it will be broken. On the battlefield, the so-called counteroffensive was uh, came up empty, and there wasn't really much in the second year of the war, much territorial uh, exchange or, or difference. The sanctions are not crippling the Russian economy. Domestic support for the war in Russia appears to be pretty robust, despite the, the really heavy losses. But for all that, you know, Mr. Putin, I think, seemed pretty cocky. And my guess is what he's looking most at is November 2024. And whether you know, if Donald Trump uh, regains the Oval Office. Richard, you've been really clear on your messaging to Ukraine. You said we've had a real problem where there's an enormous gap between the goals of the policy and what the realities are. And that the idea that Ukraine's going to militarily liberate all the land that Russia occupies is laudable, but it's not going to happen. So what are you basically saying now to Zelensky? Are you saying 
find a way out, find a way to settle this. Don't drag it out for another year. I know what I think Ukraine needs to do is switch from an emphasis militarily on trying to liberate the 20 percent of its territory that Russia is sitting on to focusing instead on holding the 80 percent that it has. I'm not asking them to give up on their long term claims, but I just don't think it's militarily realistic. They're going to be able to liberate this territory. It, it requires far, far more in the way of military and economic resources than are currently being made available or likely to be so available. If, if there was a compromise on the table, if Putin said Donbass and we'll get out of the rest of Ukraine, I'm sure he wouldn't. But you would say that that was an optimal point at which to to kind of cut your losses, would you? Well, again, I wouldn't sign away their long term rights. That's up to Ukraine to decide. But if, you, if you're asking me, are there interim arrangements? where you would have a ceasefire, where Ukraine would get to, to hold 80% plus or of its land. You'd have to talk about its ability to export uh, its grain and so forth. But look, like everything else in life, you've got to look at it. You've got to compare it to all the alternatives. And the alternative, I would simply say, and this is where the so-called friends of Ukraine, I think, get it wrong. The alternative is, in realistic terms, is not the successful liberation of Ukrainian territory and a, a transformation of the battlefield and a Russia that loses the war and, and, and withdraws. I simply don't think that's, that's on. So I think Ukraine has to be open to alternative military strategies and needs to be open to uh, diplomacy. Again, not we're not talking about formal peace treaties or to use a Middle East phrase, final status, but I can imagine ceasefires, armistices and so forth. So again, I think anything diplomatically is probably on the back burner for another year. That is victory for Putin then. And why should no, he not stop? At all. What, why not would at he all. stop then? Well, I mean, I let, let, well, Richard, let me just put an additional point to you, which is that, you know, we saw in 2014 they took over Crimea. They've taken more land since then in the 22 invasion. Aren't you just saying, right, well, Russia hasn't taken over the whole of Ukraine, but but, it, but the the door is open. You can try again in a few years time. No, not at all. I mean, again, if you're interviewing me. Let me say what I think. But with the way you're characterizing it is dead wrong. I think this has been a colossal failure for Putin. His original goals were to essentially extinguish Ukraine as a viable, independent, Western oriented country. Last I checked, he's failed miserably. Ukraine has uh, fought Russia to a standstill. And by the way, the current fa phase of the fighting has not gone in Mr. Putin's favor for the most part. There's basically been very little change over the last two years. He's sitting on Crimea and the Donbass, but 95% of what he's sitting on is what he got in 2014 when there was no resistance. And again, if you, Ukraine switches its emphasis to a defensive one, that means Russia has to go on the offensive. Russia has shown very little capacity to do that. It lacks the combined arms capability. Plus, it's much more demanding militarily. And what I want Ukraine to do is have a strategy that actually reduces its resource needs. So by going on the defensive, it would do this. And I said, no, I don't see this as a Russian victory at all. I see this as a Ukraine victory. It could end up also with various types of linkages to NATO and the EU. And in the long run, it positions Ukraine ex extremely well. Look, I keep hearing political leaders in the US from the president to the Senate minority leader, Mitch McConnell, making the argument that this is fantastic value for money, that the Russian army is being massively degraded and it hasn't cost one American serviceman mm -hmm. or woman on with no boots on the ground. Do you think that they have been sufficiently kind of clear in making that argument to the American people? Well, again, I don't think the American people are particularly focused on this. Uh, when the American people get up in the morning, they're not thinking about Ukraine. They're thinking more about inflation or migrants coming across the border or crime or, or, or what have you. So I don't think there's a, an argument, if you will, to be made that would somehow clinch it. I don't particularly like that argument also, because you know, Ukraine is paying an enormous price for this for this war. So it's, it's an awfully cynical argument. Plus it's, it's exhausting an enormous amount of American uh, equipment and munitions that you know Israel has claims on, so say does, does Taiwan. So I'm not persuaded that prolonging this war is in anybody's strategic interest. You say that Americans aren't thinking about this when they get up. Increasingly, we've noticed that they are because they're feeding back Trump's own lines to the crowds that Biden is funding foreign wars and that they feel that American money is going on, you know, in commas, 
foreign wars. And I wonder whether you think, given how much resistance there is now in parts of the Republican Party to any further spending, you know, you, you said Zelensky's trip wasn't an unqualified success. If you think that Biden is scared now of the pushback from voters on this? No, not scared. Uh, but I, look, I think you're on to something there. There is an isol- isolationist uh, theme out there. Why should we be worried about what's going on in the world, given all the problems right. here at home? Now, obviously, to me, it's not an argument that holds up analytically, but it is an argument that has traction uh, politically. And by the way, not just with Republicans. There's a lot of Democrats who agree, particularly progressives, even though, for example, as a per- as a percentage of our economy, the amount we're spending on defense is barely half the Cold War average. Mm. But Americans simply don't see it that way because there's such a high level of dissatisfaction with what is going on in the country. So foreign policy is scapegoated. And what about the idea that what you've got at the moment is America overstretched strategically, given China and Taiwan, given the Middle East, given Ukraine. And there are countries maybe like Taiwan, maybe like Finland, maybe like Latvia, who are thinking, well, if Ukraine kind of does fall or the Russians get their way, are we next? Well, two things, because I agree with parts of it and disagree vehemently with others. Uh, The United States is overstretched. We're dealing (laughs) with three geographies. We've got a hot war in Europe. We've got a war in the Middle East. And we've got to deter one in Asia, the Asia Pacific. And we simply don't have the defense or manufacturing industrial base to do that. We don't have a military that has enough planes and and ships and tanks and ammunition to to do all that. So, yes, in that sense, we are strategically uh, overstretched. And that's a real problem. And it's not it's not a problem that can be dealt with, uh, shall we say, in the short term. Uh, Again, you know, what I'm advocating for in Ukraine Uh, I think is fully consistent with American reliability. You know, what Congress is potentially doing is not. So I think what what matters there is the United States come through with a significant tranche of help for Ukraine. I think that will that would reassure uh, that would reassure our allies in Asia. In Israel, it's different. I don't think our allies around the world look at what we're doing vis-a-vis Israel, have doubts about America's loyalty. I think the problem there is we disagree with our ally. And the dilemma facing the Biden administration is what do you do? When you and your our ally or partner are not on the same page strategically. And that, I think, is an, um, will be one of the defining challenges of 2024 for this for this president. And as you suggest in your question, it will have real domestic political uh, implications. Yeah. Richard, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak to us. Yeah, it was a really great pleasure. Thank you. Please come back again. So let's get a slightly different take on all of this with Max Bergman. He is the director of the Europe, Russia and Eurasia program at the US-based think tank, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and served under Barack Obama in the US uh, State Department, where he was a special assistant uh, dealing with uh, international security. Max, we've just heard from Richard Haas there saying, look, Ukraine is never going to achieve all its objectives on the battlefield. It is not going to retake the occupied lands. And therefore, what you need to do is sue for some kind of peace. And I think that's a fair representation of what he has said. What do you what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, that's an argument that you uh, hear around Washington, I think around other, especially Western European capitals at times. But look, I think it's a little too deterministic uh, argument that Richard Haas is making there. I think a lot is left to be decided in this war. And sometimes we think that uh, a war that is a, a now what looks like a long war of attrition is at a stalemate. And, and you know, that's what we sort of thought during World War One, And then suddenly it wasn't. You know, at one point, uh, one of the sides was attrited and broke. Uh, and I think in this case, uh, right now, we see Vladimir Putin in Russia thinking that the advantage is on Russia's side and wanting to to push their advantage. And I think, you know, the United States has a lot of experience, actually, with with wars of occupation. And despite being vastly uh, economically and militarily superior to the adversaries in which we're fighting, such as in Iraq and in Vietnam, we found ourselves actually not being able to cope with with a long war and not uh, being in it for the many years uh, and in some cases decades that were necessary. Uh, and, and I think this is where the advantage probably sits with Ukraine 
in a long war. So I don't know if I agree with Richard Haas that this has to end in negotiated settlement. I think that's one possible outcome. But I think we're still uh, in a situation where it's very much undetermined where well, Ukraine will head. W- would you call that argument defeatist, Max, this idea of, of just playing defensively, of negotiating a settlement and saying, you know, we'll take what we can get away with now? Well, I think I would call it more presumptuous. Uh, presumptuous both on the direction of the war, but also, frankly, it's not our call. Right? Yeah. It's not the United States does not have the leverage over Ukraine to say, you know what, I think you've had enough and it, it's time to to call uh, Vladimir Putin. And, and also whether Vladimir Putin would answer the phone. I think we're finding out the answer and the answer is no. Except the US does have leverage. I mean, really importantly, that, that Zelensky was there in his armchair next to President Biden saying this isn't charity, it's insurance. And yeah. I guess the American people who who sort of listen to that and sympathize with that for the first, what, 12, maybe 18 months are now sort of growing impatient with that. They don't they don't see it as an insurance policy. And it's the money that they, they don't want to see leave America now. Well, I think first, we certainly have leverage, but this is an existential question for Ukraine. And that, then our leverage, uh, I think, runs out when we're if we were to push for a policy uh, approach that a, the Ukrainian public is firmly against, which they are, and also the Ukrainian president is firmly against. So I think we have there are limits to U.S. leverage, uh, and we're seeing those limits right now play out in Israel. But that's particularly the case in Ukraine. When it comes to the funding uh, of uh, for Ukraine, I think the first thing to understand is that while the president of the United States at any moment could press a nuclear button and sort of create a nuclear annihilation, Uh, One thing he cannot do is give away U.S. weapons to a foreign country without, frankly, the money from Congress and the authority from Congress. And as of October 1st, which is the end of our fiscal year, all that money in that calendar has sort of reset and those authorities have reset back to the uh, pre-war levels, which means that Ukraine is running out of money. And, and the president doesn't have the ability to just simply give Ukraine uh, weapons the way that he did before. So needs Congress to act. So this is an incredibly complex negotiation that Ukraine has sort of now being held host- hostage to. And the reason they're being held hostage to it, the ultimate issue, is that you have a weak Republican Speaker of the House that doesn't want to bring a piece of legislation to the floor, Ukraine funding, that would divide Republicans. And Ukraine funding divides Republicans. And that's the ultimate issue. And so it's now being tied with all these other things. God, you can understand why Vladimir Putin had a smile on his face this morning when he, you hear all of that, don't Right, you? exactly. So I guess the question is, Max, do you think that victory, whatever that looks like, is in Putin's mind now? He gave this very long, I think he's probably still giving this very long, <laughs> televised press um, conference, sort of call-in show. He looks like a man who's feeling quite chipper. Yeah, I'm really nervous, really, really nervous, because, look, I think we sort of defaulted into, oh, the counteroffensive didn't work, and now the war is in a stalemate. But Russia has ramped up production. It's now producing 100 long-range cruise missiles a month. Last year at this time, it was producing 40. It's been uh, keeping those in, in reserve, and it's about to bombard Ukrainian cities to try to exhaust Ukrainian air defense and, and to pummel the Ukrainian people. Uh, And if it is able to do that uh, successfully, well, then it could potentially impact uh, the war. It could start bringing its air force into this. So the war is not over. We're not at a stalemate. The Russians think they have an advantage, uh, at least in terms of industrial production. We, the West, both in Europe and the United States, haven't ramped up production enough. Uh, And if the United States cuts off Ukraine, suddenly Ukraine might not have the air defense munitions to protect its cities uh, and its forces and the artillery to defend from a, what would be a Russian onslaught. So I think Putin sees a chance to reverse his humiliation of the last almost two years and to really take it back, basically destroy the Ukrainian military, um, wreak revenge on Ukraine. So I'm I'm incredibly worried that we're sort of in the stasis of thinking that we're in a stalemate and there can be mm-hmm. negotiations when the Russians see a, a lot of war left to fight. Max, that's a really depressing note to end on, but we're very grateful. Thanks for your time Thank with you us. very much. Thanks. If you just heard the sound of a door opening and closing, it was to herald the arrival 
of Lewis Goodall in the studio. He insists now on fanfares. Oh, I'm glad. I wondered how long it would take before we had some sort of Christmas singing from you. Obviously, last year we had. Oh, I want to see if she can get that really high note because not that you were in trouble there. I'm saving that till next week. By absolutely no popular demand whatsoever, Emily Maitlis returns to singing. No demand from you, Scott Benton. Mr. Scott Benton, MP, MP. But for not much longer, almost certainly. Yeah, so Scott Benton uh, is the latest uh, Conservative MP, latest MP to find himself almost certainly victim of a recall petition. So Scott Benton MP has been the MP for Blackpool South since 2019. He has been found to have been in a, quote, very serious breach of House of Commons standards rules rules by the Common Standards Committee, which has said that he had given the message that, quote, he was corrupt and, quote, for sale. The committee went on to say that he communicated a toxic message about standards in Parliament, that he had unjustifiably tarnished the reputation of all MPs. The report said that Benton had suggested that he would be willing to breach Commons rules in return for payment from a company which turned out to be fake. This it was an undercover Times expose where he uh, comments were recorded. They went on to say that his comments gave a false impression of the morality of MPs in a way which, if the public were to accept them as accurate, would be corrosive to respect for Parliament and undermine the foundations of our democracy. Benson said he didn't consider his actions to be a breach of the rules. He said that he complied with the letter and spirit uh, of the rules, although he did say that the meeting was a lapse in judgment. And so they've thrown the book at him, haven't they? They said it's a 35-day suspension and it only requires a 10-day uh, suspension before you can trigger a recall petition in your constituency. Yeah, that's right. So he's been recommended for 35 days and if the House of Commons approves it, which they almost certainly will, um, then yes, there will be a uh, recall petition in his constituency of Blackpool South. And this is a constituency where he only won the seat with a majority of just over 3,000. So uh, Labour a second, they will be almost certain to win it. Sunat will face another by-election, which he's almost certain to lose. And this will also be quite an intriguing one because it is a seat where reform being led by Richard Tice, won't expect to win the seat, but there will be some expectation that they could potentially eat in quite substantially to the Conservative vote. It's the sort of seat where they might perhaps do well, and at least they will need to try and show, because they are polling reasonably well at the moment, you know, 10%, 11%, but they, when it actually comes to elections, they don't tend to do very well. So they will need, if they're going to have some momentum going into the general election, they will need to actually show that they can win some proper votes in a seat which, in theory should be quite well disposed to them. I think for Rishi, it's interesting, isn't it? Clearly, the bad news just kind of won't stop coming. But I guess it also ties him back to what he said on his first day at Downing Street, which is, you know, accountable, transparent, responsible, can't remember the phrase, but, you know, I'm going to clear out the scandal. This is what clearing out the scandal looks like. In a way, it's a win for him. There is another... Uh, recall petition which is actually about to conclude in the Conservative seat of Wellingborough with Peter Bone after he found himself at the end of another standards report about his behaviour. So they were probably likely to, the new year is probably going to start before we get to the spring with at least two by-elections which are, I mean, uh, Wellingborough is a, is a harder seat but given it's not beyond the realms of possibility given how well Labour have been doing in well, by elections recently, and, yeah. yeah, completely not so far away well, from. from funny you say that because the person who's in charge of the mid beds campaign for Labour, Peter Kyle, is now on the beat in Wellingborough. So go. he is clearly taken on the mantle. On the beach. <laughs> yeah, or on exactly. the beat is in There's like a, a great beach in yeah. Wellingborough. <laughs> no, but he's whatever worked in mid beds. We're going to try again. Wellingborough, same campaign team, same strategy. And the by elections that come early in the new year, obviously will have a particularly profound dynamic or important dynamic in a sense that as soon as we get to next year, we will start talking about the election, which almost certainly will be later this year. And again, if those by-elections go wrong, well, two things are likely uh, to happen. One, more pressure on Sunak, perhaps on the leadership front, but also makes it less likely there is a spring election because why on earth would you want to go from two but terrible by-election losses in, say, February or March or April and then go straight into an election I'll tell into, you the, why. into the spring? Unless you want to make sure the by-elections don't happen at all. Well, unless you are terrified of your May 2nd local results well, yeah. and you think we'll just get everything out there, the John Sopel May sweepstake date, you say May the 2nd is going to be the date where either we'll have a terrible set of local elections or else we just disguise the whole thing in well, one big general election. Can I give a little shout-out to David Cameron? Oh, which is on. a little shout out to David oh, is Cameron, that what we're doing which, is the, which is that Lord Cameron, if you're listening, thanks for your invite to your foreign office drinks. Not anyway, a little <laughs> shout out to him in this sense, which is that 
The recall legislation that he introduced when he was prime minister and under the coalition government has proven to be a quite radically powerful bit of legislation. It was genu generally considered to be quite weak at the time when Zach Goldsmith was sort of arguing for it. But it has actually proven quietly revolutionary in the sense that in the past when this had happened, you would have just had MPs lose the whip and they'd have been sanctioned and suspended from the Commons, but they would have just sat out their days mm -hmm. in the Commons, whipless, partyless, until the next general election. Now MPs either lose their seats as a result of recall when they've done something bad, or they resign before the recall petition happened, a la, say, Boris Johnson, because they know that if it goes to recall, they're almost certainly going to lose their seats. So it's, and it's added to the dynamic when a, when a government is struggling. Of, of their travails and their woes because they just faced these by-elections that ordinarily would not have happened before these recall petitions came along. The quiet irony of that, though, as you said, big advocate of the recall legislation was one Zach Goldsmith, yes. who was very, very vocal about it around 2014, who then went on to lose the um, chance to be mayor of London, who then went on to lose his own seat, I think not once but twice, but still managed to get ennobled, end up in the House of Lords and back in the Cabinet, <laughs> uh, clearly without any democratic vote having gone his way. It's so, a great thing of British democracy, though, isn't it? Yeah. That you can be voted out by the people and then you find yourself <coughs> back given a life period. Yeah. Nice. Nice work if you can get it. One other update, perhaps, before we go, which is on the um, the Lineker story that we brought you yesterday, and that was off the back of comments by the incoming BBC chairman, Samir Shah. Now, I went back and had a look at the guidelines a bit more closely, and it sounds as if the chairman actually didn't totally understand what the BBC had agreed, because it seems that if a politician directly criticises somebody on Twitter, that person has the right to respond to a personal allegation, attack, yeah. attack, as long as they do so with civility, as long as they're not abusive. So technically, unless you find Gary Lineker's responses, in quotes, abusive, mm. technically no rule was broken, which I think is why the BBC has been pretty relaxed about what's gone on over the last few days. We haven't seen a statement from them because they understand that no rule was broken. At, at least that's how I'm reading it at this point. Which makes it very interesting then that Samir Shah went before the committee because I thought that the, the obvious thing to do was to dead bat and just say, look, I, yeah, I don't know the rules yet. I, and he did that over another subject, actually, concerning one of the directors of the BBC lobbying for a certain person to be installed as the Ofcom boss, i.e. This is the story that Alan Rusbridger has been um, very vocal pursuing. And it's from Nadine Dorry's book. Exactly. And, you know, on that question, Samir Shah says, I'm, I'm not briefed on it. I don't know the detail of it. Mm. But he didn't do that when he was asked about Gary Lineker. He kind of gave an answer which suggested that he thought that he was in breach of the rules and that he was sure the BBC was looking into it. And what you seem to be suggesting with, you know, what the rules say is that actually Gary Lineker didn't break any rules. Yeah, I don't know. Is, is calling somebody a bit thick abusive? Probably not, really. Depends how you say it. You're a bit thick. Is that it? was really but, hurtful. Yeah, yes. exactly. That's horrible. Yeah, that's that's nasty. Really nasty. Yeah, exactly. I feel really Awful, right? crushed. Yeah. And that's the end of our glorious relationship. <laughs> Well, it's a good thing neither of you will be here tomorrow. We'll leave it to you tomorrow. Today. Thank you very much. You, do you, would you feel confident to be able to take uh, it from here I'll, tomorrow? Look, I mean, I'll do my best. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the shadows of giants, but I'll do my best. <laughs> bye no bye. fanfare to say goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Right. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 